بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي ونسلم على رسوله الكريم وعلى اله واصحابه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين اما بعد in the last day session mufti sahab started to speak about rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being khatamun nabiyyin that is on page 700 and today we will move on to page 701 in page 700 there were different ahadith that indicated Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being the final prophet. And he said in clear words, la nabiya ba'di, that there will be no prophet after me. And uh, even people like Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who had a very special innate quality within himself that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed ayats in accordance to the wishes of Hadha Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu yet still Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he didn't say that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a prophet Ay, there were verses that were revealed in accordance to the likes and fancies of Hadha Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu Somewhat like if you remember when Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he wanted to wage war against those people who did not pay even the rope of the camel in, in zakah. And Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu wanted to do that because he thought this was the instruction of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu to be rest assured and be contented that what Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu is doing is in reality that which the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have done. Sometimes it used to happen that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not thinking of that which Umar was thinking about. He wasn't thinking about revelation. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was saying that, you know what, O Messenger of Allah, it should be like such and such. And Nabi alayhi salatu was salam didn't take, think much, much of it until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed the ayat in accordance with that which Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu desired. And it is known, those ayats of the Quran are known as Muwafiqati Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The Muwafiqat of Umar. Those ayats that have come in agreement with Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Nabi alayhi salatu was salam Knowing the status of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, لَوْ كَانَ نَبِيَ بَعْدِ لَكَانَ Umar. If there were to be a Nabi after me, it would be Umar. وَلَكِنْ لَا نَبِيَ بَعْدِ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ But there is no Prophet after me. There is no Prophet after me. And many different traditions, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has indicated to the Sahabas that for sure he is the seal of all prophets and we would have heard about the seal of prophethood nabi alayhi salatu wasalam had on the back had on his back and the sahabas described it it was bulged out like that of a pigeon's egg like that of a pigeon's egg and the sahabas used to see it when the rasul sallallahu alayhi wasalam had his, had his back exposed different hadith nabi alayhi salatu wasalam he explained to the sahabas that the likeness of me and the likeness of all the other Anbiya alayhim salatu wasalam is like a perfect castle that you can walk around this castle and see that the, the castle seems to be perfect. The fortress seems to be perfect except that it is missing one block and that one block is me. I am filling the space of this perfect ca castle and now it has really become complete and perfected. So there will be no prophet after him. And so many different examples that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he proved to the companions and made rest, he made them rest assured that there would be no prophet to come after him. The, hence the reason probably why we would have heard how the sahabas radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een behaved after the demise of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They knew that there was not going to be any prophet after him. And they had a very affectionate love for the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they really couldn't handle it when Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam passed away. 
But Alhamdulillah, they had to gather themselves and understand that, look, life goes on and then inshallah, after the stage of life, we will meet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the point that we are making, how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went out through the entire sequence of events, up on straight until Yawm al Qiyamah, the Sahabas knew, the Sahabas knew that there was no Prophet after Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One incident also, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after the Asr Salah, he stood up until the Maghrib Salah, started to mention all the different signs that will be until Yawm al Qiyamah. And then in the end, he told them also, after he told them all the signs about the Dajjal, Isa alayhi salatu was salam, the sun rising from the west, he told them, look, the, you see how much of the day has already gone, and we just stood here from, until, from Asr until Maghrib. It is just, the, the similitude of that is just like the entire world. Much of it has already gone. Much of it has already gone. All that is remaining is like the time from the Asr until the Maghrib. So the Sahabas radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een, they knew fully well that this world, it is very short, it is very temporal, it is a very short time that we have to spend in this world. They were not expecting any other Nabi, especially when the Sadiq al-Masduq, the one, the most truthful of those who could speak the truth, told them that there will be no Prophet after them. Of course, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told them that there would be liars, that there would be deceivers, there would be imposters, there would be people who would surely claim that they are prophets. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam again warned them. He warned them not to follow such deviated and misguided persons, even though, even though they may see tricks, even though they may see sorcery, magic spells, witchcraft, etc., all these are forms of misguidance and the people of knowledge and intelligence, my dear respected brothers and sisters, could never become entrapped in this type of trick and these types of witchcraft and sorcery, etc. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has made this deen very clear and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, subhanallah, sometimes we just touch the surface of a hadith but if we really go into the books of a hadith, we will see how much more Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually told the sahabas in depth as, as to what will happen. And page 701 that we are beginning today, inshallah, it is mentioned in the notes here that such statements claiming to be prophets and actions occurred at the hands of Aswad al-Ansi of Yemen, and Musaylama al kadhab the liar from Yamama, both of whom claim to be prophets. Every man of intelligence and understanding understood that they were liars and were misguided. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curse both, both of them. And this is a statement here, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curse both of them, is something that yes, Muslims, we are very soft people, we are very kind people, compassionate people. But when it comes to Allah and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is no mixing of matters, my dear respected brothers and sisters. And hence the reason why, alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, we can stand up firmly and say and believe that whatever we have today from Allah and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is surely from Allah and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And those wicked people, whoever came on the face of the earth, and they tried to misguide people, then they got such types of curses from previous ulama, from pious people of the past. You know, they used to speak about them. And it so happens that Nabi alayhi salatu was salam, he foretold of different people who would claim to be prophets. And it so happens that these two people that are mentioned here, they were there in the time of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aswad al-Ansi of Yemen and Musaylama al kadhab They were there at the time of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There were other people who used to attack Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
They used to do Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam all sorts of things and say that he was a magician, he was a sorcerer and tell people don't listen to him, try to divert people from him. But many of them did not claim to be prophets. That's a different stage altogether, my dear respected brothers and sisters. That's a different stage altogether whereby a man is actually claiming to be a prophet. But alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us signs whereby we can recognize who is a Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he caused the moon to split in two, that was not like any magic. Go back to the days of Prophet Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. When Prophet Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, he was told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, throw down your staff. He himself became frightened when he saw it, be it became like a big serpent, serpent, huge, humongous serpent. Imagine that, my dear respected brothers and sisters. But look at that compared to the, the ropes of the magicians. That was just seeming. It was seeming that it was something real, but in reality, it was just magic. It was not something real. But the staff of Musa wasalam, was something real. Other example, when Prophet Musa wasalam, he put his hand under the armpit and then raised it. It was like lamp. It was like a lamp. It was shining. The other magicians could not outdo him with regards to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed him to do. And the point that we are making, my dear respected brothers and elders, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it abundantly clear to the believers and to those who want to seek the truth that, look, this man is a Nabi, what he has with him is truthfulness. What he is doing, he is telling you it is not from himself. He says it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a miracle that he is using to guide people. And subhanallah, human beings with a little bit of intelligence and a little bit of understanding, my dear respected brothers and elders can recognize that. They can recognize that. Imagine Aswad al-Ansi and Musaylama al-Kadhab trying to speak to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And imagine the audacity. We will make mention of a few statements of Musaylama al-Kadhab. Musaylama al-Kadhab, as we mentioned, he lived during the time of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he foretold the sahabas about Aswad al-Ansi and Musaylama. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told the sahabas that whilst I was sleeping, I saw in my dream that this is mentioned in Bidaya wa Nihaya. Reported from Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said, whilst I was sleeping, and remember the sleep of the Anbiya alayhi wa salatu was salam, it is not like our sleep. Their eyes sleep, but their hearts do not sleep. They are vessels for wahi and revelation. He said, I saw in my two hands bracelets from gold. And the condition of these two bracelets, it started to worry me. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inspired me at that time that I should blow upon these two bracelets. And when I blew upon them, they became scattered and they become broken up. And I interpreted them as two liars. I interpreted these two bracelets as two liars who will come after me. One is Al-Ansiyu wal akharu Al-Musaylama. One is Al-Ansiyu, the other is Musaylama. And... Uh, Musaylama, at the time of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came and he met the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Musaylama was firstly a Muslim. Musaylama, firstly he was a Muslim. The people from his tribe, they came and they visited the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Musaylama, he stayed back, looking, taking care of the, of, of the goods of his people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to some traditions, he gave them silver and he also sent a portion of silver to Musaylama. Afterwards, Musaylama started to change his story and concoct a story. And he claimed that wahi and revelation was something to be shared between him and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he came 
to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he told him, if it is, I believe in you, I, will, I have no problem in believing you, but on one condition, when you pass away, I will be your successor. I will follow up your prophethood and I will be a prophet after you. Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam, he had a little stick in his hand. In some traditions, it mentions a little twig from the date palm tree. He says, I would not even give you this much of the date palm tree, much more for giving you the status of prophethood. And uh, in, another, in another riwayat, it mentions that Musaylama al kadhab he sent a letter to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Min Musaylama Rasulillah ila Muhammad Rasulillah. This is the gut and the goal of Musaylama al kadhab He said, From Musaylama, the Messenger of Allah, to Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah. Salamun alayka. Peace be unto you. And then it goes on where he mentions again that I have been made an, a partner in the affair of yours. And uh, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wrote back to him, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Min Muhammad Rasulullah ila Musaylama al kadhab Right? From Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Musaylama al kadhab Salamun ala man al huda. Peace be unto those who follow guidance. Amma ba'd, fa'inna al-arda lillahi yurithuha man yasha'u min ibadihi wal-aqibatu lil-muttaqeen. He said the earth is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will make inherited from his servants whomsoever he wishes. And wal-aqibah, the aqibah is for the God-fearing people. The end result is for the God-fearing people. Not people who lie and try to share prophethood with the man who did not come to share his prophethood. He did not even choose prophethood for his own self. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him to be a prophet and he is not the one to dictate who is a prophet. He cannot share anything of his affair. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could not do something out of his power. And this man, Musaylama al kadhab he had the goal to state that, you know what, I am, I am a partner with you in this prophethood. As, we, as has been mentioned, my dear respected brothers and elders, a person with understanding and intelligence would know that this man, Musaylama al kadhab he was not a prophet. In order to be a prophet, you have to speak like a prophet. Yes, they try to make words like the Quran, though it may have a rhyme, but it did not make sense like that of the Quran. And no one, even though they make a, a rhyme, a line of a stanza of poetry, even a short stanza of poetry that would sound nice, the understanding of it, my dear respected brothers and sisters, will never ever be the same like that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala worded the Holy Quran is something totally beyond the comprehension of mankind. We just read it and try to understand it, my dear respected brothers and sisters, but it is very, very deep. It is very, very deep. So Musaylama, he, he was a magic man in reality. He was a magic man and the tricks he used to perform, he would take an egg and cause it to go down a long bottleneck, a, long, a, a bottle with a long neck. That's the trick that he would do to show that he was a prophet. Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam did not have to resort to these, type of, these types of, you know, insignificant tricks. Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam, subhanallah, without him wanting it, the trees bowed down to him. The stones used to give him salams. When the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam went to certain places, he would recognize the stone that used to give him salam. These are things, my dear respected brothers and sisters, which are worthy of merit, not an egg going down. A bottle, the, the, the neck of a bottle, you know, and different things they would do out of magic. It is mentioned in, in, in Bidaya wa Nihaya that he was the first one to do something like that, right? So people might be astonished. Yes, a bottle, a, a, an egg going down a, the neck of a bottle, but that, not, that doesn't have anything to do with regards to showing that this man, mashallah, is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are just tricks and many people can do tricks. Many people can do amazing things even with the shayateen. But that does not make them a prophet. That does not make them a prophet. And 
Musaylama al kadhab he was he was killed in the time of the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam at the age of 150 sorry Musaylam al kadhab he was killed in the time of Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiyallahu ta'ala anhu and Al Aswad Al Ansi, he was killed in the lifetime of the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was killed in the lifetime of the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So every man of intelligence and understanding understood that they were liars and were misguided. May Allah curse both of them. May Allah curse both of them because, as we said, this deen is so righteous. It is so clear. It is so clear to everyone who looks into the religion of Islam. And they will see the beauty of Islam. They will see the truth of Islam. And they will understand that people like these, these types of people who try to cause people to go astray, that in reality, this is why people would put a curse upon them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curse both of them. In the same way, continuing in page 701, inshallah, in the same way, everyone who makes such claims until the day of judgment will be deemed as a liar. This false claim of being a prophet made by people will continue until it ends with the Dajjal, the Antichrist, reported in Tafsir Ibn Kathir, volume 3, page 494. As we have mentioned, Nabi alayhi salatu was salam said, many people will claim, there will be many kathaboon, many people will claim to be a prophet, but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he taught us about the antidote, my dear respected brothers and sisters. Follow the sunnah of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Follow the Holy Quran. The last of them, the Dajjal. Nabi alayhi salatu wa sallam also, he told us, he diagnosed the problem and he told us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what we ought to do. When the Dajjal comes, he will, he will do all sorts of things. And he will, it will seem that he has powers. It will seem that he has powers and Nabi alayhi salatu was salam, he let, he let the sahabas know, knew, know of the different types of powers that he would have. And he said that, you know what, he will come with fire and he will come with water. He said, what is fire? You go into that, that is not really fire. It's just he's making an imaginary thing there, it's not really fire. What is water? Don't go into that. People will think that it is cool. So the point being, my dear respected brothers and sisters, Islam being a perfect deen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us in every age and every era until Yawm al Qiyamah what is the way out? How does a person not get entrapped by these people? Musaylama, he also made things like alcohol and zina permissible. If a person does that, those things cannot be permissible, my dear respected brothers and elders. Those people who any type of religious affair whereby you can see dhahiratan apparently. They are doing things wrong. It does not add up. So much so they will be considered as a cult. People will be considered as a deviated sect from their particular religion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it clear, my dear respected brothers and elders, what is Islam? What is the meaning of Khatamun Nabiyyin? And we cannot be misguided by all these little by all these people who will come up and make false claim. The gist of the above quotation of Hafiz Ibn Kathir has been mentioned by many scholars in their respective books. All have clearly stated that the entire Ummah has unanimously stated that there will be no Prophet or Messenger after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This must be the belief of every Muslim. If a Muslim does not believe in this, then something is wrong. This is why Wherever we go, my dear respected brothers and, brothers and elders, we know who we are. Birds of a feather flock together. Sometimes you will see that a man says, I am a Muslim. Say, yes, brother, come on, mashallah, let's pray, let's eat. And then something starts to change. You see them pulling out a stone to perform salah. Or you start to see them doing something different or quoting something different, doing something that is weird, doing something that is awkward. And then all of a sudden they start to speak about another individual. His name is Mirza Ghulam. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. And they claim him to be a prophet after the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Once that occurs, we know that, look, 
these people claim to be Muslims, but they are not Muslims. So in order for a person to be a Muslim, they must acknowledge that Rasulullah is the last and final messenger. If they do not believe that, my dear respected brothers and elders, then they will not be a Muslim. Hence the reason why Qadianis are not considered to be Muslims. Yes, you have, for example, you have the Shia. You have different types of Shia. You have some Shia who just, for the sake of simplicity, they just love the Ahlul Bayt more. And they will make ghulu and extremism in certain aspects. But they acknowledge Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the last and final messenger. Therefore, they will not claim them to be unbelievers. Because they have just went, went astray on a certain point. But they did not go astray with regards to belief. Belief in Allah, belief in the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, belief in the finality of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The words of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are explicit, definite and straightforward on this matter. There is no room and allowance for interpretations and exceptions. In this regard, the great scholar Qadi Abdul Fadl Ayyad, who died in the year 544 AH, wrote in his famous work, Ash-Shifa, the entire ummah is unanimous upon the fact that the words and statements that mention that there will be no prophet after the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are in their literal and clear meaning. The understanding and message gained from the statements is what is meant from the literal and clear words. There is no interpretation and no specification or exception. Therefore, there is no doubt regarding the disbelief, kufr of all groups who follow those who make a claim of prophethood. Anyone who, follow, anyone who follows a, a person who claims to be a prophet after the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then he is upon a path of kufr. This is something that is unanimously agreed upon the ummah and has been mentioned by very, very great scholars as called the Abu Fadl Ayyad and many more and many more. The belief in the finality of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying that there is no Prophet after him does not mean that Prophet Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, would not return as a Prophet. Indeed, he will return as a Prophet to the world again, but not as a new Prophet. He was already made a Prophet by Allah and this station of Prophethood shall not be taken away from him. As such, when he returns, he will be recognized and known as Prophet Isa salam, but will carry out and implement the teachings of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Mention has been made here of a Prophet that is going to come. Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam, he also foretold about this coming of Prophet Isa alayhi salatu wa salam. The believers also, they are awaiting this, my dear respected brothers and elders. Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam spoke about the Antichrist. He spoke about Isa alayhi salatu wa salam. He spoke about Imam Mahdi. This deen of Islam did not leave anything uncovered. We all as human beings, all that a human being needs to be, that he needs to be successful on the face of the earth, Rasul, and in the hereafter, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made it abundantly clear and, and foretold of that. He told them that, he told us how to live it, how to live life, how to believe, what to believe in, what not to be fooled by. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us about Isa alayhi salam. He went so far to say how much years he would be living on the earth and he would have a family, where he will be buried. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke about all these things. My dear respected brothers and sisters. So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yes, he did make mention about Isa alayhi salatu wa salam. But when Isa alayhi salatu wa salam comes back, it does not go against the statement of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la nabiya ba'di, there will be no prophet after me. Because as has been mentioned in your previous classes, we understand what is the difference between a prophet and a Rasul a prophet and a messenger. And Isa alayhi salatu was salam, yes, he revealed, he, it was revealed to him, the Bible, 
right? The New Testament. But is it when Isa alayhi salatu wasalam comes, is he going to be preaching the New Testament? No. He is going to be following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He is going to be following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He will be a follower of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So in this regard, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam did not leave out anything. Nabi alayhi salatu wasallam said, La Nabi Abadi. And he also did say that the Prophet Isa alayhi salatu wasallam will return. This is not something that Nabi alayhi salatu wasallam had a choice in. Before the coming of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Isa alayhi salatu wasallam was taken up into the heavens. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that in the Holy Quran. And Allah and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he taught us of the return of Isa alayhi salatu wasallam. So we do not have any misunderstanding. There, my dear respected brothers and sisters, it does not confuse the Muslims. It does not create a big faction whereby Muslims now they are worried, debating over this fact about Isa alayhi salatu wasalam coming back. Our deen is not strong, our deen is not firm. No, that does not change anything, my dear respected brothers and sisters. Unfortunately, some deviated sects, they have gone astray and they have tried to debate about that and made very, very different types of have different idea, ideas and ideologies and different types of beliefs about Isa alayhi salatu wasalam in this regard. But alhamdulillah, ahlu sunnah wal jama'ah, we have preserved whatever Allah and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam has taught us. While explaining verse 40 of Surah Al-Ahzab, the great exegete Abu Hayyan writes, the words of the verse brings about an established text which establishes the belief that there is no prophet after the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The meaning of this is that no one will be appointed as a new prophet after him. This does not negate the descent of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam at the end of time as since he was appointed as a prophet before prophet Muhammad. When he descends, he will practice upon the sharia of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and will perform salah towards his qibla as if he is part of the ummah. As if he is part of this ummah, the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because this for sure is the final ummah. The verse ends by saying, and Allah is ever all aware of everything. It means that Allah is fully aware and knowledgeable of the statements and actions of everyone. Nothing from the state of man is hidden from him. He, is full, he has full knowledge of what is better for his prophet and of the decree he has made for him in all situations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my dear respected brothers and elders, whatever situation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused to happen to Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam, though it may seem like persecution, though it may seem like torment, though it may seem like hard living, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all aware of everything. He knows why he took up Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, has him in the heavens and then he will cause him to come in the last time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew why that would take place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew why the sequence was caused in the manner that he wanted it to be caused like that. And he knew why he chose Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam as the last and final prophet. This is the great knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he has full knowledge of what is better for his prophet and of the decree he has made for him in all situations. Surah Al-Ahzab continues in verse 41 and 42 and states, O you who believe, remember Allah with much remembrance. And verse 42 states, and glorify his praises morning and evening, morning and afternoon. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered his servants that they should remember him in abundance. The commentators state that the verse means that the believers must be engaged in the dhikr remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in abundance. They should utter the sacred and blessed words of La ilaha illallah, Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, so many different types of 
Azkar, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has mentioned to us, my dear respected brothers and elders, Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam, in different traditions, he mentions about us doing the dhikr of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, he tells us, remember him with much remembrance and glorify his praises morning and afternoon. Glorify his praises morning and afternoon. Nabi alayhi salatu was salam, from morning to evening, my dear respected brothers and sisters, he would remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would do the dhikr of Allah. He would remember Allah, remember Allah in his heart, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his tongue. So much so, even with the argument with regards to when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came out of the washroom, he said, Ghufranaka. He said, forgive me, O Allah. So under the discussion with regards to why did Allah subhanahu, why did the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say ghufranaka, some of the commentators and ulama have mentioned, it is for the reason, one reason is because Nabi alayhi salatu wa sallam had to stop off dhikr with the tongue. But he would always be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But because the dhikr of the tongue had to cut off, then... He said, Ghufranaka, this is just one angle. Hadha Aisha radiallahu ta'ala she mentions, Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Yadkur Allah azza wa jalla ala kulli ahyanihi. That the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would remember Allah all the time, all the time. Remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something, and a, a very, very great ni'mat. And it is something that we are ordered to do, my dear respected brothers and, brothers and elders, to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of the traditions here will let us know how we ought to remember Allah. And even in the notes, we will see different aspects of how we ought to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In one tradition, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to the companions, Should I not tell you a thing that is better than all your deeds? and is most acceptable to your Lord, and which would raise your grades, and is better than giving silver and gold in charity, and arms, and is also better than your embarking for jihad, when you face and kill the enemy, and the enemy kills you. The noble companions asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about that thing. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Dhikrullahi azza wa jal. The remembrance of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the mightiest and the most glorious. This has been mentioned in Ibn Kathir. Now, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is making very strong statements. More than jihad fi sabilillah, fighting the enemies. More than performance of salah. More than giving charity. My dear respected brothers and elders, in different hadith he mentions about salah also. More than salah. And sometimes... It is because the commentators have mentioned because dhikr of Allah, it can be done all the time. But salah, it was only for specific times. Salah is only for specific times. But dhikr of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be done at all times. Imam Ahmad and Tirmidhi have reported that Hadha Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he heard a very special prayer from the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he would never miss. He said, O oh Allah, make me so that I keep thanking you profusely. I keep obeying your instructions. I keep remembering you abundantly. And I safeguard to follow your advice. I safeguard to follow your advice. In another hadith, a Bedouin Arab said to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the number of good deeds, obligations in Islam are so many. So tell me of something concise that I could really hold on to it. I cannot do many things. Tell me of something concise. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, لا يزال لسانك رطبا بذكر الله تعالى He said, your tongue should always remain wet with the dhikr of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
when it is difficult to do all the front types of ibadat, to do even in some hadith mentions, a man is too weak to wake up in the middle of the night and do ibadat of Allah, or too coward to go out and fight jihad, do the dhikr of Allah, do the dhikr of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sayyidina Abu Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu has narrated, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, أُذْكُرُ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى حَتَّى يَكُولُوا مَجْنُونَ Remember Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much so that the people will start to say that you are a madman. Alama Ibn Kathir has reported this from Musnad Ahmad. Remember Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much that people would consider us that we are mad, my dear respected brothers and elders. The dhikr of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so important, so important. Nabi alayhi salatu was salam, in certain ahadith, he said, those who are silent, they will be saved. And in other ahadith, he mentions that one must not engage in much talk unless the talk is Allah's remembrance. This is so because excessive talking hardens the heart and hard-hearted persons are the most distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, remember him abundantly, Nabi alayhi salatu was salam, my dear respected brothers and elders, is telling us that we ought to remember Allah, choose not to talk so much if there is no need to talk, and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot. Another villager asked the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Who is the best person? Who is the best person? And the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, the best person is the one whose life is long. He has long life. And the reason that his life, the reason that it is good that he has long life is because he does good deeds. He does good deeds and he will be able to become closer and closer to Allah. And then the person said after that, well, if long life is the best, the best person is considered to be the one who has the longest life, then what is the best deed? <coughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that you leave this world while your tongue is moist with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's dhikr reported by Imam Tirmidhi. <coughs> so these are just some ahadith, my dear respected brothers and elders, that shows us the virtue of the dhikr, shows us how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to encourage his companions to speak less and do the dhikr of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have mentioned here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, remember him with much, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with much remembrance. And this can be done by saying, La ilaha illallah. It can be done by saying, Allah, 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 Subhanallah, Astaghfirullah, any, any, any type of dhikr, my dear respected brothers and elders, any type of istighfar, seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The believers must continue to praise Allah and thank Him for the numerous favors and blessings which He has bestowed upon them. They should glorify Him night and day, in the morning and in the evening. And as we have mentioned, a very good and easy way of doing this, my dear respected brothers and elders, learning the du'as that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said when he woke up in the morning, when he was going to sleep, when he was going to put on his clothing, when he was going to take a meal, after he drank milk, after he drank water. It is a very easy way for us and our children to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Page 702, inshaAllah. Hadha Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, No one is excused for leaving out the dhikr of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except one who has lost his senses 
only that person who has lost his senses, then he is the one who should be really excused from doing the dhikr of Allah. Other than that, we are all required to do the dhikr of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One should engage oneself in Allah's remembrance for most of the time, as ordered in the above verse. While explaining this verse, Qatada alayhi rahmah says, Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar, wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, reported in Tafsir al-Bahr al-Muhit. My dear respected brothers and elders, there are so many adhkar, so many adhkar that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that we really cannot finish saying all those different types of adhkar, what is required from us that we learn some of them to the best of our abilities and keep reciting them insha'Allah. From the command given in the above verse, one can clearly understand that being engaged in dhikr, remembrance of Allah, is a very important act of worship for the believer. By ordering the believers to do his dhikr in abundance, Allah has not fixed a time, limit a qu or quantity for his remembrance. Instead, he has left it open so that one can always be engaged in the dhikr. Whether one is on journey, at home, sick or healthy, busy or unoccupied, one can be engaged in Allah's dhikr at all times. All times, my dear respected brothers and elders, we are sitting, we are walking, we are doing things. We can be remembering Allah, we can be getting a lot, a lot of reward that we will see some of the benefits coming up inshallah. But the dhikr of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanallah, there are a lot of benefits, great, great benefits that we can achieve. Why? Because we do the praises of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have not created man and jinn except that they worship me. And as we said, five times daily salah, that is for certain portions of the day. What about the other times of the day? What about the other portions of the time within that day, my dear respected brothers and elders? We can do the dhikr of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whether we are on journey, whether we are home, whether we are sick, when we are, whether we are healthy, all different states that we are in, walking, standing, sitting, we should remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Traditions on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have mentioned many great benefits and virtues of doing the dhikr of Allah. Some of these are, one, it brings one closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When a person does dhikr of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes close to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ana inda dhanni abdi bi. I am with the thoughts of my servants that he has about me. And I am with him when he remembers me, as we will also see in another one of these benefits. It bring one, brings one closer to Allah. Allah says, He is with us when we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He is with us when we remember Him. So it brings us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When people are accustomed calling the names of other people, and looking out for other people's help. Sometimes it has been seen in the past, my dear respected brothers and elders, that a person who is a Muslim, they will be asking for the help of other people. And they will be, they will be turning to worldly things, even on their deathbed. But when we are accustomed hymning the praises of Allah, when we are accustomed calling Allah, Allah, then at the time of need, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make us remember Him, my dear respected brothers and elders, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be there for us, inshallah. Two, it increases and strengthens the iman. Dhikr of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it increases and strengthens our iman. Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam said, Al-imanu yazidu wa yankus. Iman increases and iman decreases. Iman increases and iman decreases, somewhat like our health. Sometimes we are good, we are up and about. And then sometimes again, we have a little common cold, we have the flu, we have the virus, some viruses are a little more stronger than some. We have a headache, some are small, some can be considered as migraine headaches, etc. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my dear respected brothers and sisters, sometimes the iman goes down and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can raise it. A very, very good way of causing our iman to be strengthened and raised in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by doing the dhikr of Allah. Three, it polishes the heart and causes it to shine with light. It polishes the heart. The heart, Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam has explained 
in his traditions, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran mentions, Kalla balrana ala kulubihim ma kanu yaksibun. But, but it is the rust that they have earned that is upon their hearts. And Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam mentioned about shaitan coming like a mosquito and sticking out its beak there at, at, at um, you know, on the heart of, an, an, of a believer doing the dhikr of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help us with all these things. It will cause the, the heart to be it will cause the heart to shine again doing goodness, subhanallah, good acts. Saying good things, it will remove the black spots that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about, my dear respected brothers and elders, and it will cause the heart to shine again, inshallah, for it brings about light on the face. When people used to see Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam, they would say, surely this is not the face of a liar. When they see the face of the companions of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam, they understood that these people are good, worthy of, worthy of trustworthiness. They, they were good, honorable people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala somehow makes it apparent on the face, my dear respected brothers and elders. Five, if it, it is the life and soul of every act of worship. It is the life and soul of every act of worship. Salah, which is such a great foundational pillar of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَقِيمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِي do perform salah, establish salah. Why? For my remembrance. All these things that we do, my dear respected brothers and elders, it is in order that we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the life and soul of every act of worship, concentration and devotion in the dhikr of Allah. Six, it brings peace, tranquility and contentment in the heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'innul kulub. And subhanallah, if we really want contentment of heart and we want, to, we want our hearts to be cool, we want to be tranquil of mind and be at peace of mind, do the dhikr of Allah. Surely, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes it to happen and makes it a reality, my dear respected brothers and elders. Seven, angels keep in the company of those who are engaged in the dhikr of Allah. We may not see them, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can cause them to be a guidance for us in the ayats of the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that about the angels, we were your friends in this world. How can they be our friends in this world? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. When the angels are with us, then inshallah they can ward off all different types of evils that can come to us, my dear respected brothers and elders. Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam did mention that a believer can have so many different angels with him. One that takes the record. We know Kiram and Katibin writing down the good, writing down the bad. One will record the amount of the rule that we send upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. One in front of us that can ward off angels, ward off different types of evils. So if we do the dhikr of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can make the angels our friends in this very world, as he mentions in the Holy Quran. It, it brings about mercy and compassion to the person. It brings Allah's mercy and compassion to the person. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees, MashaAllah, my servant, he is giving me, he is giving me, he is doing all for me. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have mercy on this servant and he will show his compassion to the individual. Nine, it brings about the love of Allah in one's heart. Allah begins to love this person and he orders the creations of the heavens and the earth to love this person also. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves an individual, it is something very, very great, my dear respected brothers and elders. And that is not something easy, but with hard work and sacrifice. And it is really not much sacrifice on our part, my dear respected brothers and elders. After all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us everything. We just have to do little things as remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ سَيَجْعَلَ لَهُمَ الرَّحْمَانُ وُدَّا Certainly those who believe and do acts of righteousness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put love amongst themselves. Under the commentary of this ayat, the commentators have mentioned the hadith of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that 
when the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves an individual, he calls Jibreel. And he says, oh Jibreel, I love such and such an individual. So you love him. Imagine that, my dear respected brothers and elders. The angel who was entrusted with sending revelation from Allah to the, to the, to the Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam, angel Jibreel, Archangel Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him and tells him, I love such and such, you love him also. And then Angel Jibreel is commanded to tell the people of the heavens that, O oh, people of the heavens, Allah loves such an individual, so you love them also. And subhanallah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves an individual, then they become the friend of Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Man adali waliyan faqad adantuhu bil harb. Whosoever makes enmity with my friend, I wage war against them. Whosoever makes enmity with my friend, I wage war against them. 10. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to remember the servant as long as the servant remembers him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to remember the servant as long as the servant remembers him. A. When we are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my dear respected brothers and elders, and we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at times when we, we may not be so needy, at the time when we really need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will call, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be there for us and He will remember us inshallah. 11. Dhikr brings life to the heart and takes away its rust and hardness as we have mentioned before. Nabi alayhi salatu was salam, he has also mentioned the similitude of the living and the dead is the one who remembers Allah and the one who does not remember Allah. A, the one who does not remember Allah is like a dead person. And the one who remembers Allah is like a one who has life. Because after all, we just see life as our hands and our mouth moving and we are speaking. But in reality, the soul that is within us, it is going to leave this body one day. And that is a different life that is going to live. So that is something else there, my dear respected brothers and sisters. With regards to that, ruhani and spiritual life, dhikr brings life to the heart and takes away its rust and hardness. We will stop here, inshallah, and continue next day. Jazakumullah. Please walk with this page and we will continue next day. Jazakumullah. Assalamu alaikum. بتأسى كل يوم على بعضها ليه دنيا الناس بتنسى يوم رجعها لربها ليه ضيع بين الأمان والأمين نفتكرها ليه بنخ